Welcome to In Search of Excellence, our quest for greatness and our desire to be the very best we can be, to learn, educate, and motivate ourselves to live up to our highest potential. It's about planning for excellence and how we achieve excellence through incredibly hard work, dedication, and perseverance. It's about believing in ourselves and the ability to overcome the many obstacles we all face in our lives. Achieving excellence is our goal, and it's never easy to do. We all have different backgrounds, personalities, and surroundings, and we all have different routes on how we hope and want to get there. Today, my guest is my great friend Strauss Zelnick. Strauss is the former COO of 21st Century Fox, the former CEO of BMG Entertainment, the former chairman of CBS. He's the founder and CEO of Zelnick Media, a leading private equity firm that manages over $25 billion in assets. And he's also the chairman and chief executive officer of Take Two Interactive, a publicly traded video game company that's best known for its Grand Theft Auto franchise. Take Two has over 5,200 employees around the world, earned more than $3 billion in revenue last year, and has a market value of $21 billion. Strauss is also a fitness fanatic. He's 63 and looks 40. And in 2018, he graced the cover of Men's Fitness Magazine. Strauss, welcome to In Search of Excellence. Thanks, Randy. Great to see you. Thanks for having me. We have a lot to talk about today, but I want to start off by telling our listeners and viewers how we met 25 years ago. At the time, I was 26 years old and was in my second year practicing law. I wasn't really enjoying it and had decided I wanted to try my hand in the business world. Long story short, I came up with this idea to write letters to CEOs asking for informational job interviews. And when I shared this idea with people, everybody told me it was really stupid, that it was a total waste of time and that nobody would ever meet with me. So I wrote 300 letters and I got 80 meetings. There's some nuance to the story, which we're going to get into in a little bit. But Strauss, I wrote you a letter and here we are today. So I appreciate you responding to my letter. That's such a great story. And I didn't, I didn't know that. I had no idea that you devoted that much time. And now I vaguely remember the binder. Um, but what strikes me most is that, um, you know, this long, long enough ago that we were writing letters as opposed to an email. You've had an amazing career, someone I really look up to. I want to start by talking about your childhood. We all grow up in a certain environment. It makes us who we are today. What were your parents like and what kind of upbringing did you have? What kind of values did they instill with you then that led the way to where you are today? Uh, well, I grew up in Massachusetts and New Jersey. My dad was a successful lawyer. Uh, my mom was... Um, Occasionally, a bookkeeper for his firm. When he started his own firm, she was the bookkeeper, but usually stayed at home and um, had uh, five siblings. And um, we were, it was a pretty big, rambunctious crowd, and you had to take care of yourself and look after your siblings. And, you know, this, these were the days where parents were not helicopter parents. And you basically, especially with six kids, you know, you're kind of, you had to take care of your own after school activities. You had to find ways to get around. I had a, uh, if I wanted spending money, I had to earn it. And, um, um, but it was very loving, very supportive. Also, my parents were and very good about not putting any particular ambition onto me. In other words, whatever I was excited about doing, they were supportive of, um, arguably too supportive at times. Um, so I had to figure out, you know, on my own where. I had talent where I didn't have talent because they never said, oh, you know, you're not as good at that. You are as good. From their point of view, anything that I was interested in was was good. Um, so I had to be, there was definitely an expectation that, you know, you would do well in school um, and be a responsible, decent person. But apart from that, there really weren't any expectations. So I was, I would, I, I both was expected to and and did chart my own course. Certainly no one in my family thought. Wow, you should go into the entertainment business, for example. You mentioned if you needed money, you had to earn money. What kind of things did you do to earn money when you were a child? Um, well, I as a child, I don't think much, but as soon as I was able, I started babysitting. Uh, I I was a guitar player, so I gave music lessons. Um, and ultimately I ended up entertaining at children's birthday parties because I realized if I could figure out how to do that then that would make me a lot more money per hour than anything else a, a teenager could do. And I was somewhat successful at it. I was, I was a um, birthday party clown. 
Um, and then I got really tired of putting on the clown makeup and I decided I'd just be a birthday party magician. And uh, it both, you know, worked out pretty well. I, um, I, wasn't, I wasn't a great magician, but you don't really have to be. I, was, I think I was pretty funny. That helped. And um, I only did birthday parties for five-year-olds because five-year-olds are the perfect age. They're um, old enough to enjoy what you're up to and young enough that they don't feel the need to figure out the trick behind the magic. They were just like wide-eyed, curious, and sweet. As soon as I got into six-year-olds and, you know, they were, they were tearing apart your tricks and trying to find out how they were, worked and below five, they couldn't really follow. I also made balloon animals. So I had apparently a great talent for making balloon animals, amazingly enough. I don't even like balloons. Um, so I, I made enough money to, to buy my first car doing that. What kind of car was it? Uh, it was the worst car ever made, but it was beautiful. It was, I, I loved, loved and still love sports cars. And um, it was a Triumph Spitfire, um, which was just, Triumphs were just terrible, terrible cars. And to put it in context, um, it was like six years old when I bought it. And I brought it when I was deciding to buy it to the, my local English car mechanic and said, what do you think? And he looked it over and he said, whatever you do, don't buy this car. And I did anyway, because I just fell in love with it. And, it, and he was right. It was a disaster, but I loved it. I kept it for, I kept it for a couple of years till I ran out of money and I couldn't support the car anymore because it constantly needed work. You mentioned being a magician at kids parties. My son, uh, Charlie, who's 17 now, he was in a magic for a very long time. And one thing I noticed is the success of a magician is largely dependent on your delivery of the trick. It's not so much the trick itself, but how you present the trick. And he's very good at public speaking. I think that's where it came from. Did it also help you to be a magician and learn certain skills at a very young age that you took with you as you made your career and graduated? Um, perhaps. I mean, I, I just, I had no shortage of uh, self-confidence, even if it was misplaced. I, mean, I was a lousy magician, but the kids seemed to have a good time. But again, I'd selected the audience. So like it was the perfect audience. They weren't going to have a bad time no matter what you did. You're a great student. Let's talk about when you realized you could succeed in the classroom. Did you always do well at school? You went to Wesley and then you got a JD MBA from Harvard, both incredible schools. You graduated summa cum laude from Wesleyan, just incredible, very hard to do. Did that come naturally or did you have to work very hard to get good grades and walk, walk us through the education starting when it became important to you? Well, I went to public high school in New Jersey. It wasn't the most demanding school. And um, I thought of myself as a very good student. But in fact, I was kind of, I was kind of not, you know, I, I certainly wasn't, you know, working as hard as I could possibly work. And I thought I, my family had been going to Harvard College for generations. So I kind of thought that that's where I was going to go to college. And when I was touring schools, I went, I visited Harvard. And I was like, wow, this is perfect for me. It's exactly where I belong and where I should go. I'd sort of neglected to note that um, at our public high school in New Jersey, the top three kids got into Harvard every year. And I was not in the top three. I wasn't close to the top three. I was sort of the top 5%, which isn't horrible, but it's not the same thing. It was a big school. And so um, I applied to Harvard. I didn't really pay much attention to uh, anywhere else I applied because I just made the assumption I was going. And, um, but I did apply to Wesleyan, um, which I'd never heard of. My mom just said, why don't you apply there? And uh, I applied to a couple other schools. So P.S., I, I didn't get into Harvard. I didn't get into any other schools I applied to, but I did get into Wesleyan. So the choice was made for me. And I was really like, that was a huge wake up call because I didn't, I, I just didn't understand. Like I couldn't, I couldn't process this. So I showed up at Wesleyan with a chip on my shoulder because I thought, you know, why am I here? Not at Harvard on the one hand. And the other hand, I realized that half the class um, went to prep school and I, they were vastly better prepared than I for college. Um, so I just worked my brains out for the first time in my life because I really hadn't done that in high school. And lo and behold, I did really well at Wesleyan. And I, um, in my first semester, I, I think I was first in my class. Um, and I stayed, I stayed there because I was like, just, well, I can do this. I want to do this. And, um, I graduated second in my class. Um, and it was the first time in my life that I'd actually excelled at anything as opposed to sort of thinking I was great at something or being told by my parents, wow, you're great at this. Um, 
it was the first time it actually excelled, like objectively it excelled. Um, so I wasn't a natural student, but I was a good student and I liked being a student. And to this day, I'm a good student. I, you know, I get, I get lessons when I want to learn things. When I, I learned to ski as an adult and I got lots of lessons, you know, I've, I'm into fitness. I've got trainers. I uh, learned to speak German. I had a great teacher. I have enormous respect for teachers. And I'm, I'm, when I set my mind something, I usually can learn it pretty well. Um, so in that way, yes, I think I'm a good student. And I ultimately had a great experience at Wesleyan and I had a great experience at Harvard. You know, I went to Harvard, I think, primarily because I wanted to show Harvard that not only could I get into one school at Harvard, I'd get into two. I didn't really need to go to either to be in the entertainment business, but I did have a really good experience there. You always knew you wanted to be in the entertainment business? I did ever since I was a little kid. I, I thought I wanted to be an entertainer. You know, again, my parents were like, oh, yeah, you're really talented. So I, I played guitar and I wrote a bunch of music. I had like I was on a really good day. I was mediocre, but I did not know that. And I only really learned that in college because I was playing like the local coffee houses. And I realized that my friends would come to support me. But I, like when I when I was 19, I finally had this blinding flash, the obvious, which was no one really liked what I was doing. And I really wasn't very good. So I I, I actually abandoned that. And then I started um, writing and I thought maybe I'd be a writer. And I took that really seriously and did better at that. I had more talent at that. Um, but ultimately, I wasn't I didn't love writing enough to to make that a profession. And it was at that point that I realized, OK. Yeah, I'm really excited about all things creative. I love, you know, entertainment. I love creative properties. I love books and music and movies and television shows. This was before the days of video games. And, um, but I really don't have, a, you know, I really don't have a real creative bone on my body. I seem to have some affinity for business. I was always, I had a sense I was pretty commercial. And uh, I decided, well, you know, then maybe the best way to approach this is be in the entertainment business. And I made that decision pretty early on. Why get a JD MBA if you knew you wanted to be in the entertainment business? I know lots of people who wouldn't spend money on the grad school. Not only are you going to one, you're going to two. Why go at all? And why the law degree and the business degree? Why not just the business degree? Um, I applied, first of all. I only applied to three grad schools. And remarkably enough, I got in. And I thought if you get into the JD MBA program at Harvard, you know, why not go? Uh, I also thought, as it turns out correctly, that you know, it's really, really hard to break into the entertainment business. And I thought that set of degrees would differentiate me and would help me start in the business at a level higher than your standard entry level. Because the way to get into the business in those days and still now, um, honestly, was to go work, you know, as an assistant or in an agency training program. And neither of those jobs paid enough to live on. I had no ability to ask my family to help support me. Um, but they also give you, you know, a very long route to upward mobility in the business, although it works, it does work, and it's where most people start. So I thought if I if I got a JD MBA, especially from a place like Harvard, maybe I could start at a higher level. And indeed, that's that's exactly what happened. And I sort of was able to catapult my career by spending the four years in grad school. So walk us through it. You graduate Harvard with a JD MBA. You have a blank canvas in front of you. How did you map out what you wanted to do? Where did you apply? What kind of job were you looking for? And then ultimately, where did you end up? I wanted to, you know, run a movie studio. And I would say, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, sort of def has defined my career is knowing what I want. And I'm sure you remember from our first meeting, I asked you, what is it that you want? You know, because anytime I'm in a, a coaching and mentoring situation, and I'm in many of them, I have of hundreds of people I, I work with at any given time. It's about 25% of my time. You know, the starting point is what do you want? Not tomorrow, but mid or long term. And are you working in, in service of those goals? And I knew I wanted to run a movie studio for better or for worse. In fact, I wrote the uh, essay in the Harvard Law School yearbook my first year in grad school. And the essay was about how, despite the fact that I was in law school, I wanted to run a movie studio. And I would think that it would be kind of bizarre to commit that to paper in front of your peers. But I, I did it intentionally because I really, you know, I wanted to I wanted to own that ambition. And by telling other people, first of all, I thought it was interesting, uh, perhaps in retrospect, highly egotistical, didn't feel that way at the time, because after all, I wasn't head of a movie studio, so maybe it looked silly. But by owning the ambition publicly, it sort of cemented it. 
So I started applying to jobs, but there are no one recruits in the entertainment business, particularly not at those grad schools. They still don't really recruit. Um, I, I applied for whatever training programs there were. There were a few. NBC had one. Then, in fact, NBCU still has one now. Um, I didn't get it. And uh, But luckily, I had had my first summer job in grad school was at Viacom. And I met a bunch of people, and I had stayed in touch with them. And one of them had left Viacom to go to Columbia Pictures Television. And he needed someone to come work for him to help run the division. And I just met with him regularly until finally I wore him down and he offered me the job. So even though he knew and I knew that I wasn't remotely capable to have the job, I'd actually never worked in my life, right? I'd gone directly from college to grad school. Uh, I had just had summer jobs. and um, But he took a chance on me and I became director of international television sales at Columbia Pictures. And that was my first job. When you were thinking about your first job, a lot of people will look at a variety of factors, look at money, experience, location, responsibility, people they work with. The industry seemed like it was the most important thing to you. Where do the other factors rank? Did you even inquire about the money? Did it matter to you at all? Well, it mattered, but I didn't have a choice. It was the only offer I got in the entertainment business. Then I had, you know, the standard offers one gets when you're in those programs, which is consulting and investment banking. And I, I spent a summer doing consulting at McKinsey, and I really loved it. Um, I didn't want to be an investment banker because they work too hard. And I you know, had this desire not to work that hard. But also, again, I wanted to run a movie studio. So I had offers from three or four investment banks and offers from three or four consulting firms. And they were very prestigious, and they paid a lot of money. And then I managed to eke out this offer from Columbia Pictures that paid about half of what the other jobs offered. Um, and I had student loans to pay. But I looked at it and said, if my goal is to be head of a movie studio, even though this job at Columbia Pictures is in television distribution, has nothing to do with movies and nothing to do with making movies, aren't I better served to go to Columbia Pictures than to Goldman Sachs or McKinsey? And if that's truly my goal. And um, I'm always astonished when, you know, talented people who have options, and I was fortunate to have these options, will say, well, you know, it pays more. It's like, you shouldn't be worried about what your first job pays. Like if that's relevant at all to your later career, it's that you have a bigger problem than the one we're discussing. Um, and it's prestigious. Well, who cares about that? Um, it, you know, it needs to be something that speaks to your greater ambition. And I knew that. And so um, it was, an, it was sort of a hard choice because economically it was you know, a bit challenging, but I you know, was getting paid enough to live on. So I went for it. You mentioned you applied to the NBC training program. How many jobs did you apply for in the entertainment business? Were, was it only these two? And then how did you deal with the rejection? Well, I, like you, I reached out to a lot of people, either through tenuous connections or introductions or a cold. And unlike you, I didn't do all the homework you did. Uh, and I wasn't as, um, I, I didn't do a very good job of it, apparently. So I, I got a handful of meetings with other people. But you know, the, the meetings were typically pretty short and pretty cursory and not super helpful and um, didn't lead to any other offers. So ultimately, I had the banking and the consulting offers and the Columbia Pictures offer. That was it. And one of the reasons that I decided to, you know, have an open door for everyone, yourself included, um, was because there were no open doors for me. And I decided if I'm ever fortunate enough to get into the entertainment business, I'm always going to have an open door. I'm going I'm to see anyone who reaches out. And to this day, I do. And um, that's what led to my coaching and mentoring practice, which wasn't intentional, but that's how it occurred. I share that same philosophy. I had so many people along the way that helped me, took meetings when they had no business taking meetings. I worked really hard at them. Nonetheless, they're very busy, but I have the same exact philosophy. There isn't a meeting I turn down uh, for someone who has actually earned the meeting. You can't just call up and say, hey, Randy, I'm Sheila or John, I'd like to come in and see you. I like them to put a little work into it, but I meet with 100% of those people. Funny enough, by the way, you mentioned um, Columbia. Mark Platt was the first meeting that I got. He was a former lawyer. He was running Columbia TriStar Pictures. I remember I'd never been on a movie, movie uh, studio lot before. I remember I got this reserved parking space in front. Here's this kid from Detroit walking in. In La La Land, I'm in LA, had goosebumps go into uh, his office. There's all these movie posters on the wall, of course, and there's a basketball net behind his desk. And the office is big enough where I think you could shoot a few hoops, but it was really, really cool to me. And I targeted Mark because he had started his career 
um, as a lawyer. And here he was running a uh, studio. So you're there for a few years and then you leave to go to a company called Vestron, which it was in a business, something called the home video company business. What, what was that and why did you leave? So um, Vestron was the largest independent um, home video company in, in the States. And that was the dawn of new media. And believe it or not, the, the first two new media for entertainment were pay television and video set distribution. And uh, Vestron had built this great little business and they were um, recruiting a head of corporate development. And I, at that point, I was vice president at Columbia Pictures. I was very ambitious. I knew that if I didn't leave Columbia, because I was doing well in television distribution, I'd stay in television distribution my whole career. You know, the, in those days, particularly the entertainment business wasn't great at sort of saying, what's your ambition? Where do you want to go? You know, I was doing fine. And their attitude was, we'll keep paying you more, keep doing the same thing. And I, I had a sense that if I went to a large independent, there might be great opportunity. I didn't really want to run corporate development, um, but I was promised that I'd have some line opportunities by the chairman. And nine months after being there, I became uh, the president and chief operating officer of the company, which at that time was the largest uh, independent public company in the entertainment business, um, which you know was quite a small company, but they were different times. Uh, and I, I was suddenly running a movie studio um, at the age of... Uh, age of 30. So it was kind of not what I expected. I mean, I was ambitious, but I didn't think it would happen that quickly. Um, and then I, I greenlit my first picture and it turned out to be a massive hit. And there I was you know, off, off to the races in the movie business. What was the picture? It was Dirty Dancing. So it became the highest grossing independent film of all time and stayed there for many years until Blair Witch Project eclipsed it years later. It also was the highest grossing movie soundtrack of all time for many, many years, I want to say 15, 20 years. Um, so it sort of, you know, cemented us at Vastron and certainly helped me personally. And I stayed there for about three years. And then I was recruited to become president and chief operating officer of what was then called 20th Century Fox. And now you're at Fox, you're managing 1,200 employees. I think Fox at that time was doing $2 billion a year in revenue. You're now the head of a major studio and you're 32 years old and i'm going to digress here for another minute and share something about your story and then fill in a couple of details about our meeting as well i've already talked about my letter writing campaign but one of the people i wrote a letter to was an investment banker named mike yegeman who was a managing director at bear stearns who ran their media practice i'd sent him a letter we had a meeting and i made a pretty good impression when when i met with him and before it ended I asked for his help getting intros to CEOs. And it was a huge risk for me. It was a huge risk for him. He didn't know me and he politely declined. But then he said something that really has stuck with me forever. He said, if you want to go hunt moose, go where the moose are. I had no idea what he was talking about. So I said, what does this mean? And he said, the annual Bear Stearns Media and Entertainment Conference was coming up in a month. It was being held in Laguna, which is one hour away from... Los Angeles, where I live, and the CEO of every major um, entertainment company was going to be there. And he said, Randy, you're invited. And that was really incredible of him. I'll always be grateful for that. I'm sure you remember all the people who did every nice thing for you as you were making your way up. Uh, I remember every person who helped me, and this was a huge help for me. So I get the invite, and then I went to work. I hit the client development code again and researched every CEO who was going to be there. And there were around 30 to 40 at the conference, and 75% of them were on my hit list. I had made a hit list, and then I printed out the articles, and then I was highlighting and putting this letter writing campaign together in the second bedroom of my apartment next to the Jack in the Box in Westwood. So I had this my list, and you were not on the list. The reason you weren't on the list is I was looking for people in LA, and you were based in New York. But when I read about you, I said to myself, I've got to meet this guy. I was 26, and this guy, Strauss Zelnick, is running a movie studio when he's 32 years old. So you became number one on the hit list. I wanted to meet you. I wanted to find out how did you do this, get your advice, maybe even the job. And you were doing basically like a, a, a drive-by. You flew in, you spoke, and then you headed back to New York, and you were really busy. I could see people around you. When you speak, you get the circle. And then you're leaving the building, and there's 
three people deep and then two. So I kind of waited my turn. I followed you out the door. I think it was at the Ritz Carlton. I introduced myself as you're walking out and I asked you if you had a few minutes and you could have blown me off, but you stopped for a second. You shook my hand and you told me to call your office in New York to set something up. Um, I sent you my letter first and then I called. We're going to come back to that story again one more time, but you're a 20th century fox. You're in your dream job. You dreamt about running a studio. Now you're running a huge, well-known studio. It's incredible. Your, your dream came true. What were you thinking? And when you got there, what did you actually do running a studio? Well, my, what I mostly thought was I have no business doing this job. Um, <laughs> as I, I said to my friends, uh, I'm definitely not capable to do this now, but I'm certainly glad I have the opportunity. Um, and you know, it was a turnaround. Fox was the last place in the box office when I joined. And within a year, we were first uh, at the box office and stayed there for the remaining three years that I was there. Um, you know, the, the job was to turn around the business and it was pretty moribund, old fashioned business. And we updated it and, um, you know, updated the team and upgraded the international group and upgraded the deal making. Um, the creative part of the business was run by my boss, Joe Roth. I ran the business side of the equation um, until Joe left. And then I was responsible for both when Peter Chernin became my boss. Um, and I stayed uh, under Peter, who was a great boss, really a great boss, a very generous person, very kind person, until the opportunity to go um, become an entrepreneur came along six months later. I recruited him. The deal with Peter was he was like, I don't want you to leave, but you can leave if you replace, re get your own replacement. So I had to re replace myself. I thought pretty highly of the job I was doing. So I said, there's really only one person in the business who I think would you know, do as good or better job than I in this. And that was Bill Mechanic, who was at Disney in a very, you know, very happily so. I didn't know Bill very well, but I knew he was happy in his job and it took me about six weeks to recruit Bill, but I did. And uh, Bill and Peter went on to, to do just great work at, at Fox and build the studio significantly from where we had left it um, and innovate in any number of areas. So um, that was that was kind of the Fox experience. But you were there three to four years. Let's talk a little bit about the time that you were there because you're indicated you wanted at some point to be a entrepreneur and you laugh. But when you took the Fox job, were you thinking this is going to be the last job I ever have? I'm going to work my way up at Fox and Peter's your boss, but at some point are you going to replace Peter and report to Rupert Murdoch? What what was the picture like when you got there? And were you thinking this whole time, I'm just training for something else? I was always ambitious. Um, the truth is my first goal had been to run a movie studio. And while I wasn't the chairman of the studio, because Peter gave me a responsibility for both creative and business, at that point, I had the job, effectively had the job. Peter was responsible for a lot of other areas as well. Um, and I'd been running movie businesses for now seven years between Vestron and, and, uh, and Fox. And so, sure, all those things being equal, my ambition would have been to be chairman of the studio. And had I been given that opportunity when Joe left... I, I definitely would have stuck around longer, perhaps much longer. But I, I was passed over in favor of Peter. And at that point, I'm, you know, I looked at it and said, okay, realistically, I have to do this job for four or five years before Peter gets bumped up again, which incidentally is what happened. I think Peter was in that role as chairman for about four or five years before he was promoted uh, inside the organization. And I, even if I were really optimistic about my chances, I looked at it and said, you know, that job's not going to be any different than the job I have now, really, because Peter gave me a lot of latitude. And I, so I had to begin to think about what came next. And I sort of redefined my goals from running the movie studio to running a diversified media business with an, with an entrepreneurial uh, slant, which is to say I wanted a piece of the action. So now I had to start think about, thinking about what does that look like? Like, how, how can I gain the experience that would enable me to run a diversified media company? And how can I do it, you know, while being an entrepreneur? And I, what became clear to me is I had to get experiences in other creative um, enterprises. And when video games sort of came along and they were just coming along then, I looked at it and thought, wow, this could be like a huge entertainment business. This sort of feels like the movie business in the early days. 
And if I get in now, not only will I get that experience, but I could probably do it as an entrepreneur and get a piece of the action. Um, so I actually um, went to Rupert and said, you know, video games are the, are the entertainment business of the future. I'd like to start a video game company. Um, how about if I do it here at Fox and um, continue to run the movie business? And I'll do that also. I will start another division because I had numerous divisions reporting to me at Fox, not just motion picture production and distribution. I also had television distribution and home video uh, distribution, pay television distribution. I, I had it all. So to me, it wasn't burdensome to start another division. And Rupert said, that's a great idea if you want to start a video game company and I'll support that. I said, well, here's the thing. I want a piece of the action. He was like, no, 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 that doesn't really work around here. Like you can work here. We pay you well, but you know, it's part of the business. Um, and so I had an opportunity to go to, you know, a very early stage startup that hadn't released their first title in Silicon Valley called Crystal Dynamics. And I'm probably the only living person or dead person who's ever voluntarily left the job of president of 20th Century Fox or any other major studio to take a 95% pay cut and move to Silicon Valley. For a company that was less than a year old. Less than a year old, no revenue. So how did you find out about Crystal Dynamics? Did someone just, were you reading? I mean, there were no publications even to read at that point. I assume no video game publications, maybe no, a couple of magazines. So how, how does this come about? How did you learn about a, a recruiter named Bob Fell, who was a friend of mine, reached out and he was doing the search. And, and he said, I know you I know you want to do something entrepreneurial and I know you want to broaden your base. Why don't you come look at this? He said, Kraus, I or he said, uh, Strauss, I know this is crazy, but I have this company that's less than a year old that is perhaps doing something pretty cool. Exactly. So Let's talk about what happened at Crystal Dynamics and where was the video game industry at that point in terms of where it is today? Where was it then? What did it look like on the map? I know, obviously, you could play board games or console games like Pac-Man. You go to a bowling alley, you play Pac-Man. Uh, Asteroids was a big thing. But where, where was the industry as a whole back then? What did it look like? And obviously, it's very different today. Well, it, it, it had already sort of established a similar structure. In those days, the big so-called first parties were Sega and Nintendo. Sony was just entering the business with PlayStation. Microsoft was not in the business yet, didn't so there was no Xbox. Um, but the hardware really was Sega and Nintendo. That was the meaningful hardware. And then on the independent side, um, Electronic Arts was relatively young, but it existed. Yeah, Activision was very young, but it existed. In fact, Larry Probst was CEO of Electronic Arts. He's still the chairman. Bobby Kotick was the CEO of Activision. He still is. Um, there were other players that are not around, like THQ. Um, there were computer titles and CD-ROM titles. Those businesses obviously no longer exist. Um, and then there were smaller independents, and the technology was rapidly escalating uh, and, and, and Crystal Dynamics was formed initially to make games for a new platform called 3DO, um, which was a 32-bit platform that was going to eclipse technologically the other platforms. Uh, and they were, they were set up to be a software house to support 3DO. Um, and I was, I was recruited there. So the business existed, it was early, but it definitely, you know, was a real business. I don't remember what the aggregate revenue of the business was. It was quite small, but it existed. You mentioned Bobby Kodak. Bobby was my stepsister's roommate in college at University of Michigan, greatest place on earth, and was coming to our house for Jewish holidays. So I met Bobby when I was 13 years old. And Bobby actually offered me my first summer job after my freshman year at Michigan, he and Howard Marks had a company. It was a different name. It was really the predecessor to what became Activision. And I needed to make money that summer. And he offered me a new Apple Macintosh computer, which had just come out. It was $1,995. Unfortunately, I couldn't take the job because I needed to make money that summer. I ultimately dug ditches uh, in a piece of land that became the uh, Weight Watchers World Headquarters in Southfield, Michigan. So I've known Bobby a very long time, uh, and what a what an interesting 
career and similar trajectory that he's had in the video game business as as have you. You went to BMG after working at Crystal Dynamics. They they came calling as well. Did Bob Fell call you up again and said, "Hey, I've got this great opportunity for you second time around. Here you go." No, it was a strange situation. Actually, was another recruiter named Bill Simon, who's also a friend to this day, who was at uh, Corn Ferry. But Bill called on behalf of BMG before I'd left Fox. So um, I I told everyone I was leaving, um, and it was about to be announced. It hadn't been announced yet. And um, Bill called and said, you know, we'd like to talk to you about being CEO of uh, of a big record company, one of the majors. And um, and it was very tempting because, again, I wanted to get experience in other creative businesses and it wouldn't involve a pay cut. <laughs> and uh, to, to the contrary, it was, it was a high paying job. And I thought it'd be super interesting and a great opportunity. And they had an interest in other businesses and were willing to invest in other businesses um, if that's what I wanted to do. But I had to say to um, Bill, look, I've just accepted a job and it's about to be announced and I've got to pursue that. And I wanted to pursue it as well, but I, I, I hadn't put it in the context of, wow, what if there were a competing opportunity at a big, really huge um, business? I mean, BMG was a $5 billion business in those days. Um, so I, I declined and um, went to Crystal and that got announced. And about a month after I got there, I got a call from the head of HR. Oh, before I had, um, sorry, it's so long ago. Before I declined, he said, why don't you just have dinner with Michael Dornaman, who headed the entire entertainment company? for Bertelsmann, which was television and recorded music. And um, I said, sure, I will. And uh, I had dinner with him and I explained that, that I wasn't available. And I, I made sure that, that that Bill told him I wouldn't be available. Um, but we had a really nice dinner. And, um, and about a month later, the head of HR from BMG called me and said, look, um, Michael really thinks you'd be perfect for this. And he's willing to wait for you. And I was like, well, I just started a new gig. I'm building this business from scratch. Like, that's really flattering, but he can't wait because it's going to take, this is not like a short-term situation. And he, and the, the, the HR uh, person from BMG said, that's okay. We're willing to wait. We, we believe this is going to be the right thing for you to do. So um, we stayed in touch. Uh, ultimately they asked me to do some consulting work for them on the movie business, which I obviously knew and they were thinking about getting into. So I did some consulting work on the side. Uh, which obviously is disclosed to the folks at Crystal. And, um, but that got, you know, introduced us to one another. And uh, two years later, when Crystal was very much on its feet, had already launched hit properties and was exceedingly well financed and had about 250 people, I decided to leave and become CEO of BMG North America, which was at that point about also about a $2 billion business. It was the North American division but was with a path towards becoming the CEO of the whole thing. And I did become the CEO of the whole thing a couple of years later. So you're learning the music business, which is new to you. And you also, while you're there, you took some of the video game knowledge and excitement and you brought it to BMG and you created BMG Interactive in, in-house. What was that? And ultimately what that became and how that led into what you're doing today, ultimately in the video game business? Well, I'll try to compress it. You know, I got to BMG and they said, what do you think about the movie business? And I said, it's terrible asset class, which it was. Let's not do that, but let's start a video game business. It's still early days. We have built-in distribution capacity. We'll bring in independent developers and we'll publish their works and we'll distribute it through our worldwide system. And um, I, it was, I thought, a pretty clever plan. And we did just that. And... Um, built up an array of products. We were developing 40 properties. And um, right before we were going to launch our first our first game, the new CEO of Bertelsmann, which was the parent of all of BMG and other businesses, um, came to me and said, I don't understand this business. I don't know why you're in it. I don't know why you've wasted all this money in it. I want you to divest the business. So I said, listen, we've already invested in 40 titles. They're all ready to go. We've already built the overhead up. It's already here and in place. The only thing left for us to do is distribute the products and bring money in. And even if we're horrible at it, even if we mostly don't have hits, the structure of the business in those days was we probably would have gotten our capital out or close to it. I said, on the other hand, if you want me to divest a business with unreleased titles, 
it has almost no value to someone else. I mean, I, I, I'll get cents on the dollar. And he said, I don't care. That's what you should do. So I did because I, I'm a good soldier and I was employed and I knew what my job was. So I sold, um, I sold BMG Interactive to Take-Two Interactive, which was a tiny little public company for nine or $10 million of stock. There's so actually quite a bit of stock in Take-Two because Take-Two was so tiny. And then I went to my boss and said, let's hold the stock minimally. That way, if they do well with it, you know, we'll benefit. Otherwise, I'm going to sell and get like nine or 10 million bucks. Um, and he said, no, no. And remember, we were a $5 billion business. So this was a rounding error. Um, he said, no, no, get the cash. So sold the stock, took the cash. Uh, a month later, Take Two Interactive released the first title that came to market that we had developed, which was uh, called Grand Theft Auto. And um, so Take Two you know, grew on the back of Grand Theft Auto and Rockstar Games. And, you know, that that was the juggernaut that grew Take Two and led to all the other things that ultimately, you know, have happened there. Um, I stayed at BMG for six years, brought the company to second place, had the number one and two players not merged. We would have been in first place. We had a bunch of great hits. I had a great experience. Um, and I felt at that point, I you know, I knew the video game business. I knew the movie business. I knew the television business. I knew the home entertainment business. Um, I'd gotten a lot of experience and I thought probably time to start my own business and build a diversified media company, you know, that I can have, a, you know, an entrepreneurial stake in, uh, and did so by founding ZMC and totally serendipitously in a long story. We don't have enough time for seven years later, uh, ZMC took over take two and, uh, we've been building it up ever since. I want to come back to the last piece of our meeting. You were actually at BMG at the time. Uh, we didn't sit down for a face-to-face for another few months until you were back in Los Angeles. And I, by then, I had been writing all these letters. It was going very, very well. I'd had about 20 to 30 meetings, which meant I'd sat in 20 to 30 lobbies. And in most of them, I waited quite a bit, quite a long time, in one case, more than an hour. Of course, I was the least important person on their calendar that day. So if something came up, I, I was going to wait. I had studied a long time for each meeting. I, I coach people, prepare for the meetings like it's a final uh, exam. And that's what I did. I made an outline. I memorized facts, questions from footnotes of public companies. So I started bringing my outline to these meetings to study while I waited. The same way that I looked at my materials in college right before a test, you look at it, then you put it away, and then you uh, uh, begin your test. I always arrived every meeting one hour before. I'd wait outside and then I would come up 15 minutes before. First impressions matter. Wanted to make sure they knew I was there uh, well before on time. I left. I was there one hour before because in Los Angeles, there could be traffic jams, a whole bunch of other things. So I go up 15 minutes before and the office manager, I still remember her name, Liz Ramirez, brought me out a glass of water and said, Strauss will be out shortly. And that was the first thing that I noticed. She said Strauss, not Mr. Zelnick, which was very unusual and different than any meeting that I'd had, which said something to me about the culture and the way that you treated people. So I'm sitting there in this really nice lobby and you walk out with one of these headsets on, the old kind, it wrapped around like an air traffic controller and you put your hand in front of the mic so whoever you were talking to couldn't hear and you said to me, I really apologize. I'm running late. I'm on a call and I can't get off. I'll be back in a few minutes. And you walk away and I'm thinking to myself, wow, <laughs> you're running three minutes late and you walk out yourself, not Liz, and apologize to me. It really says a lot about you and the respect you have for people, regardless of where they are and stature or position. And I've been in the business world now for 30 years. I've never seen anyone else do that. I learned that from you, by the way. So it's something else that I've copied and uh, borrowed from you. As an aside, when I went in there, you were talking to Clive Davis. Uh, in the interest of time, we don't need to go into that, but would you say that he's one of the most influential people in the history of the music business? Absolutely. I'm one of the most creative and, uh, and a great guy. I had a great relationship working with him and was very fortunate to work with so many talented people. And to this day, I work with so many talented people. But I, you know, at the risk of turning it around, I love, I love the, first of all, your memory is extraordinary, uh, Randy, but secondly, really extraordinary, but I knew that already. You do whatever it takes to get to the right answer and to get ahead. And whether that involved digging ditches or arriving an hour early or doing five hours of research for one letter, whatever it took for you to get to the next step, that was work that you put in. And the reason you've had the success you've had 
is ultimately because you you know you have wonderful attributes uh, that you're smart and charming and nice, but you also put in the work, and there's no substitute for hard work. So it's it's you know you you said as 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 an aside, but it's really compelling and a great reminder that you know we all start from nowhere. Everyone, everyone starts from nowhere. No one gets anything handed to them, even if they have connections. And I started from nowhere as well. Uh, you started from nowhere, but being resilient and friendly and kind and incredibly hardworking will open doors, always opens doors. And then of course you have to go through the door and do the work and do it well. I'm a grinder. And I think that and my work ethic are probably the two most important ingredients of my success throughout my career. And I appreciate the compliment. Back to take two, it sold, I think, more than 130 million copies since inception. How much has Grand it Theft Auto. Yeah, or sorry, Grand Theft Auto. Um, how how um what's the total gross that franchise has brought in to Take Two, which now, by the way, I think the value of the sale to Take Two is around 14 million. And I checked today, I think your market cap is 23 billion dollars today. Yeah, they held on to their 20% stake, would have worked out really well for BMG. <laughs> uh, you were referring to the title Grand Theft Auto. That's that franchise is actually sold in over 250 million units. Um, the average selling price is you know, 60 bucks. So you do the math plus virtual currency. Um, it's a it's the it's the highest growing grossing entertainment franchise of any sort of all kind. Uh, it's the number one entertainment property that's ever been creative created. So um, it's an incredible story uh, that Rockstar Games has delivered and continues to deliver. We're going to switch gears in the interest of time. I want to talk about fitness and physical health and mental health, but I also have to share another Strauss story with you. Well, two quick ones. One of the times where I, I would always call you when I'm coming to New York. I love spending time with you. I've said this many times. I wish we spend more time together. I really love it when, when we have time. And thank you once again for, for this. But you said to me, hey, do you want to work out while we're meeting? I said, sure. So meet me at the Harvard Club. And I thought, okay, I have no idea what that is. That's the closest that I will ever get to Harvard. And I told you I had no clothes. Said, oh, don't worry. They, uh, they have some there. So we're working out. You're a complete machine. And I'm thinking, how, you know, it's kind of hard to have a conversation. I'm huffing and puffing. And you're, this was 20 years ago, probably 15, 18 years ago, something like that. And I could clearly see you're in a fitness. There was another time we worked out and, and I was thinking, man, I need to get my ass in shape. And then there was another time where you want to work out in sports club, Los Angeles, which is a health club there. We get there, we meet in the lobby. I'm looking at you. You're looking at me. You remember? No, you remember? No, we're sort of laughing about it. Of course, you made one simple phone call. We were in in 30 seconds. And then we're in there. We're working out. Same thing. And when we're done, we're hanging out in the locker room. You know, we have our towels on. We're going to go take a uh, jacuzzi. It was, you know, eight to 10 feet, this big pool. And you're talking to some guy in the locker room who's clearly looks a little bit unique. And we're hanging out. You're talking. I, I really, hey, how are you? This is me. Sean, meet my friend Randy. Randy, Sean, nice to meet you. We all go into the whirlpool together. We're in there for 15 minutes. More conversation. Clearly, the guy's in the music business, but I have no idea who he is. And we all went. We got dressed. We showered. We laughed. We laughed before him. And he said, uh, you know who that is, right? I said, I have no idea. And it was Sean Combs. So uh, no, no, just says something about how uncool I am and how I'm not with it in the music business, but, uh, you love fitness. You are in better shape than anybody that I know, period, regardless of your age. When did this all start and how important is it to you? We all, one thing as well that I've noticed, I'm sure a lot of your friends do too. You work really hard. You're successful. You work very long hours. You have family, commitments, philanthropy. People will always say, I don't have time to work out. I find myself saying that as well. I'm tired at the end of the day. Can you talk about the whole fitness thing, when it became important to you and, and give us the whole story, Mr. Men's Fitness? <laughs> well, and I always... I always got exercise and I always believed in it, but it, it sort of picked up as time went on and, um, and I got more and more into fitness and health. And so when you and I first met, I, I probably worked out 
two or three days a week. Um, and then as time went on, I just decided to do more of it. And as I, as I mentioned, I spent a lot of time mentoring and coaching people. And I realized that if, you know, if I, if I was in the gym an hour a day or close to it, that'd be a great time to talk to someone because, you know, you can relax and talk and I wouldn't be subject to phone calls or interruptions in the office. So I would say to people, um, listen, if you want to get together for a meeting, we can do that in the office. You want to get a cup of coffee, we can do that. Uh, and you'll probably get 20 or 25 minutes, or if you're interested in working out, you can spend an hour, your, your call. And so more and more people, including people who worked at my companies would say, okay, well, let's get in a workout. And I found that it was a great way to catch up and also sort of remove barriers because when you're sweating and working hard, you know, pretty hard to maintain a, um, your composure or any kind of pretense. Um, and so I was able to have, you know, pretty busy work schedule and also work out. And to this day, I almost never work out alone. I always work out with, with friends or groups. And um, that makes it much more fun. Um, and I, I sort of feel like by training hard and training often with people who are a lot younger than I, it keeps me feeling young, even though I'm not young. And that allows me to th look at the world through curious, wide, young eyes. And um, I think that positively influences my investing but also helps me run entertainment businesses that cater to younger people. So it's been a it's been a great blessing, both in terms of the fact that I don't feel remotely old. I don't have any aches or pains and I stand up straight and I can do do all kinds of sports and I don't feel compromised at all by age. And I do have friends who do feel that way. They feel compromised by age already, even though I'm not that old. Um, I'm 63. But for a lot of people, they're beginning to feel, you know, like they're slowing down. I don't feel that way. And that influences every part of my life. Um, so it's been it's been an incredible blessing, great way to spend time with other people, great way to spend time with my kids. And um, and I really I enjoy the results. You know, I get to eat more, too, because I'm training all the time. Well, I remember us having lunch one day at Nate and Al's in Beverly Hills and the waitress asked you first what would you like? And you had something super, some eggs, they were super healthy. And I'm looking at the corned beef sandwich and I said, Strauss, you're making me feel guilty. <laughs> and I said, I really want that corned beef. He said, you know, go for the corned beef. So I had a fatty corned beef sandwich and you had this uh, incredible healthy meal, which didn't seem uh, that tasteful to me. But <laughs> I, I, I remember at the time though, you took it uh, seriously. The fitness was a huge part of your life. And you're talking about longevity. And you could really influence the probability of a longer life if you eat well, take care of yourself. Um, that That's part of the motivation as well. I mean, obviously, you feel great mentally, you feel great, but you're also looking at life expectancy as well in there and, and being productive while you're alive. I think it's more about health span than lifespan. I think robust exercise probably can extend your life on average, maybe three to five years. And since you know the last three to five years may not be so great. I'm not sure that's really why you do it. I think it's more health span and mental acuity and just the ability to walk around comfortably. So if we don't exercise, you know, we lose bone density, which means if you fall, your bones break and we lose our balance, which means you're more likely to fall among many other things. There's also evidence that you're much more at risk for Alzheimer's disease or other forms of dementia if you don't get exercise and that exercise can offset all of these things. So my bone density is the same as a 19 year old. I have great balance. Um, and when I go skiing, cause I'm not a great skier, you know, I fall like I'm 14 and I bounce right back up. Nothing breaks, nothing even bruises because, you know, I'm in, I'm in reasonably good shape. So it means that I can do activities, you know, at this age that my friends are already dropping out of. And I expect to be able to do those activities, God willing, in 10 or 15 years that a lot of people won't do because your body is strong and resilient. There's no reason you can't you can't do balance related activities or activities that put you at some risk of falling. Um, so that there there are many good reasons, but I don't actually think it's lifespan. I think it's much more quality of life, which is what appeals to me. Also, there are so many other um, factors that affect lifespan that you really can't influence. You know your your heredity, um, disease. So I've I've never thought that the goal is to live as long as possible. I know there are people who believe that. For me, that's not the case. I just would like to live like a middle-aged person and then die. You know, I, that's my goal. What's the best piece of advice you would give to anyone, regardless of age, on how to 
have a better life, how to have a better career? That's the first part of the question. The second part is, what to you are the three to five most important ingredients of someone's success? Well, the first piece of advice, which we talked about, is know what you want. Really think about what you want, not what is wanted for you, not what you you know see on television, not what your friends are doing. What is it that you want in terms of your life long term, both personally and professionally, and work for that goal. Uh, So many people try to pursue other people's ambitions. You need to pursue your own. And the advice that I give with regard to a career, and I think also personally, is the advice I got when I was um, when I was in grad school, and you know, in a vastly less well organized way, I would ask CEOs who came to visit school, you know, their their top uh, advice for a great career and a great life. And I realized after asking 50 of them or so, they all gave the same advice, essentially, and fell into three buckets. So that's the advice that I give, which is the first is listen. Most people don't listen. Most people learn how to talk. They don't truly learn how to listen. Um, Listening makes you smarter, makes you more effective, and, um, and makes you kinder. And it's a way to develop a relationship with people. The second is work hard. There's no substitute for hard work. We talked about that earlier. You know. Get up early, get to work early, stay late, Um, especially in the beginning of a career. The only thing that that is going to distinguish you from the person next to you is harder work. As you gain some experience and maybe some wisdom, you probably don't have to work quite as hard. But even now, I run three enterprises simultaneously. I work pretty hard. You know, I'm pretty much always on. And finally, never compromise your integrity. It's ultimately the only thing you have. Um, and I've tried really hard to pursue, uh, that advice, all three of those recommendations imperfectly. And I've I've made mistakes, um, with regard to all three. Um, but I have always known what I wanted. And if I didn't, I stopped and took time out to think about it and reestablish long-term goals. I've done that again recently. Um, and, um, it served me well, honestly, I wouldn't say that I've ever, you know, I've ever reached a point of achieving all of my goals. And I doubt that I will. But by writing them down and establishing them and owning them emotionally, I'm probably going to get closer than if I didn't do that. Can you share one of your goals that you haven't achieved yet that you want to achieve? Oh, I think, you know, one of my goals was to have the, you know, one of the biggest media and entertainment companies on earth. And we have a very significant enterprise and I'm really proud of it, but it's not one of the biggest on earth. It's getting there. (laughs) <laughs> it's growing for sure. I think I want to um, conclude as well on, we talk about time management as well. And one of the things that we hear about and which I do a lot of mentoring as well. And people, people say, I'll ask them, well, why didn't you do that? Why didn't you do that? I, I didn't have time. And that phrase should not be part of the English English language if you want to get ahead or if you want to be a friend to someone as well. It, it, it comes up a lot in the personal context too. Well, why didn't you do, why didn't you do that? Well, I didn't have time. Well, as you know, I've been working on Sandy or Yelp for Beaches for the last seven years. It's my full-time job. And Business Week wanted to write a piece on me. And I thought, all right, who do I know who has some credibility, has a lot of credibility, who people's name would recognize, who I could put Business Week in touch with to see if they'd be interested in talking to them. So I thought of you and I texted you. And you always text back very fast. You're a very fast responder, no matter where you were. You were actually about to board a red eye back from Europe on a family vacation. And you said, when do you need this by? And I told you, the reporter wants to finish the story tomorrow. So you told me you were landing. And I said, well, do you want to wait? It's okay if you can't do it. I said, no, I'll do it. So the reporter called you, I think, after an overnight flight. You had been on the ground maybe 15 minutes. You were in the car going back to your house. It just really speaks again to the kind of person you are, the kind of friend you are. So that's something I want to leave our listeners and our viewers with. We've had a lot of great lessons today, being a friend, being time, making time for people that you care about, giving back, very important to you, Strauss, I know, and to me as well. So thank you so much for being a great role model and a friend. 
and for doing our podcast today. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. I hope I was coherent when I spoke to the reporter. I probably wasn't, but uh, <laughs> appreciate your including me. And I, again, your memory is extraordinary. Uh, I, 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 I give you a, a great credit for that. Um, and it's such an optimistic memory too, which is kind of you. And um, kindness is kind of the whole shoot match. So thank you. Thanks for having me.